Hello, everybody. It is a great pleasure to host today Professor Juan Garcia Velasco, who is holding an MD and PhD degree and serves as a director of IVI Rama in Madrid. He is also a full professor of obstetric and gynecology at Rey Juan Carlos University, Madrid, in Spain, and director of the master's degree program in human reproduction. Professor Garcia Valesco, main research interests have been in IVF and endometriosis. He is the principal investigator of projects founded by the Ministry of Education and Ministry of Health in Spain, and has received award from the Spanish Fertility Society, Spanish Society of Obstetric and Gynecology, and the ESHRE and the ASRM. He has published over 200 peer-reviewed articles and edited seven books on human reproduction, endometriosis, and hypo and hyper ovarian stimulation response. He is the co-editor of RBM Online. His topic of presentation for today is implantation, the role of embryo, and endometrium. Juan, please go ahead. Thank you very much. And first of all, I thank you for the invitation to take part in this fantastic CME webinar series around the world. And it's a, it's a privilege to be with you today discussing about something that we as clinicians uh, have always a, a problem. Um, we're always trying to find uh, what's going on when we transfer an embryo and why sometimes we, we get a success and a, and a baby at home. And some of the times it just does not happen. So. We always try to understand uh, whether this is an embryo problem or is the endometrium, what is not perfect, or maybe the interaction uh, between those two players. There's still many, many things that we do not know, but slowly uh, we are getting to know um, more and more about this interaction and, and who is the main player, let's say, and who is less relevant, but also important. Um, we do know that um, in implantation, there are many things to be uh, discussed. And, and from years, we, we know that the blastocyst, the human blastocyst, has to be orientated in a certain fashion with the inner cell mass in front of the lumilar epithelium of the endometrium. There will be a, a huge interaction and, and, and a dialogue, molecular dialogue, between this embryo and the endometrium to finally achieve um, a successful implantation. The truth is that many of the things that we have been looking at for many years, and this includes cytokines and chemokines and growth factors and, and morphological issues like pinopods, at some point they seem to be like the key uh, factor that may regulate uh, implantation, but after a few years they come and go, and some of them could be very interesting and very relevant in animal models, but they do not translate into human uh, experience. And even some of them could be very important. There is a lot of overlapping of these different functions. So today we will try to dissect which one is, is more relevant. We know today, and we're absolutely convinced that uh, the chromosomal constitution of the embryo, it's crucial for this to be successful. And if we look at different species, we look at the Drosophila or, or even the mouse, and almost they have no aneuploids in their embryos, and uh, this is maybe one of the reasons why they're so fertile. However, in our species, uh, embryo aneuploidies range from 20% in, in very young uh, women, and I'm talking about women in their 20s, early 20s, still they may have aneuploid embryos, and up to 100% in women of advanced maternal age. And this uh, clearly reflects the, the failure of, of, of pregnancies, uh, natural pregnancies, as well as, as assisted reproductive uh, pregnancies with increasing maternal age. And as we know, uh, the, the natural fertility, uh, what is called fecundability, this is the, the chances of a couple, fertile couple having a baby per month, ranges between 25 to 35%, obviously related to the age, but if it's a young couple under 35, they do not, try to get pregnant this month and they do get pregnant this month. This only happens in, in one in three, one in four. It may take just several months uh, for them to get a natural pregnancy. And I think this is a, a very important concept also to explain to our couples, because today we live in this uh, uh, world where everything is immediate. If I want something, I call uh, the company or I 
go into Amazon Prime and I get it next day or even the same day. And if I want the pregnancy, sometimes nature needs time. I will have to wait for a few months to consider if there is a problem or not. And I think this concept of fecundability is very important. Uh, again, if we go into um, a species who have very low um, number of euclid embryos, like uh, rabbits or rodents, they have a very high implantation rate. However, the natural cycle is much lower in humans. And even when we have euclid embryos after PGTA, it's not 100%. And we will try to understand why. This is uh, a confirmation of what we just discussed in the previous slide. We know that uh, as the age increases, success rates uh, diminish. But interestingly, this is only with euclid embryos uh, in, in this particular graph. What I'm trying to say is that, of course, if you are older, you have more difficulties to have a baby. But even if you do a biopsy of the embryo and you have an euploid embryo, whether it's biopsy on day three, like it used to be a long time ago, or whether it's a blastocyst uh, biopsy on day five, if you look at the implantation rate, it is going to be diminished after the age of 40, even if these embryos are also euclid. So there must be something else. And if we look at the sample size of this study, it's, it's quite nice, but it's not huge. So it could be better according to the huge number of, of euploid uh, embryo transfer that are being done today. So this is what Andres Reitz tried to uh, summarize in this paper published this particular year in 2020, and it was presented at, in the last HRM. And what they did is they reviewed more than 8,000 euploid uh, single embryo transfer at the blastocyst stage done between 2011 and 2018 which is a quite large sample size. What they uh, analyze is the age of, of these couples. Uh, women in particular were half of them more or less under 35, about one fourth between 34 to 37, and then beyond 38, the rest of them. This is the, the paper that was published, uh, as I mentioned, just a few weeks ago with uh, Jason Farnesiak, uh, Richard Scott and Andrew Selly from Yale, and they looked at the percentage of, of success in bioclinical pregnancy, how many of these became clinical pregnancies, and how many of these uh, became a baby at home. So we could understand if there was a, an issue, where was this issue happening? And this is what they found. In, in women under 35, this is the implantation rate, it's 80%. These are, again, single euclid embryo transfer. And there's a, a small but significant decrease, about 10 points less in women beyond 42. This is implantation rate. So yes, even if it's euploid, there will be differences across ages. In same difference and same drop models with clinical pregnancy rate. And if you go to uh, live birth rate, ranges between over 60 in very young couples to uh, 10 points less in older women. The interesting thing here is that when we start from couples who have embryo transfer, if you look at the implantation rate, there will be differences across ages, a slightly uh, higher at the clinical pregnancy stage. But the interesting point is that those that became clinical pregnancies, they remain the same to live birth rate. So probably the difference that is related to age and not related to anubrivy is between the early stage, which it becomes at the implantation rate or the clinical pregnancy rate. Similarly, if we look at the pregnancy loss, after implantation, from implantation to clinical, there's a, an increase with increasing age. So the older the patient, the higher the chances of miscarriage, even if it's a, a if it's a, um, a euclid blastocyst. However, when it's a clinical pregnancy, once we see the heartbeat, it will make it to life death rate in a similar percentage across ages. So I think this is a very important message because we now need to understand a bit better what's going on here, what happens from uh, the very early stages, what is making this embryo not to develop uh, strong enough as to make it a live birth, what changes with aging. Another way of looking at this data is uh, uh, doing a, a multivariate regression analysis. Um, we can look at the odds ratio of having a, a, um, either an implantation in blue or a clinical pregnancy in orange or a live birth in, in gray. And we adjusted this uh, data for uh, AMH value or for the day of embryo transfer and, of course, of the morphology of the embryo. And again, if you become older, you have a significantly lower odds ratio of having a, a baby uh, and having an implantation. So you can see how the older the patient, the more difficult it is to, to achieve a live birth, even if it's an euploid blastocyst. This is what we need to figure out what, what is the reason. 
So it's not all about also aniplody. We always uh, knew that aniplody is not good for the embryo, and we may have some discussions regarding PTA analysis, but the truth is that it's not everything. Aniplody is extremely relevant and, and it's a huge contributing factor for, for miscarriages and, and failed cycles. But there is a detrimental effect of age and other oocyte factors. Uh, um, maybe the mitochondria energy production is lower. Maybe the, the, there's a DNA damage that we cannot detect today or uh, things that we do not know. But also the uterus may get old. And, and even though the oocyte donation programs usually show same results across different age strata, uh, maybe there's a, a small subtle effect on, that could be detected in, in this uh, eupidemic transplant. And we should also probably focus a little bit more on, on the uterus. There's more or less uh, the neglected uh, factor. Another way of looking at this was uh, what happened was the chances of, of a couple who goes for IVF with the GTA and has an implantation and what happens to the others? I mean, how many of these couples will finally end up with a baby at home, which is actually what our patients want. They come to us not to do a cycle, they come to us to have a baby. So um, Dr. Pirtea from uh, uh, EVRMA in New Jersey, uh, again, presented in ASRM this uh, prize-winning paper and what they did is a retrospective analysis of a, a very large database, uh, more than 3,000 couples who had an implantation. Um, that was uh, almost a 70% success rate. And those who had no implantation, of those uh, over 1,000, uh, some of them dropped out as expected, and some of them had remaining embryos, or they even went for a new uh, ART treatment. And out of this, in the second transfer, they had an implantation rate of 60%, close to 60%. And similarly, those who had no implantation, some of them dropped out and some had uh, remaining embryos or they went for another treatment. And in the third attempt, again, the pregnancy rate was similar, was 60%, and no implantation in 39.7. So we can have a nice estimation of if it's easier or not so much easier after first or second or third embryo transfer. Okay, that's fine, but the, the key question is how many babies are born after three embryo transfer? And this is what we found. Live birth rate was 64.8, 54.4, 54.1, so more or less consistent across cycles. And we plot this in a, in a graph like this Kaplan-Meier uh, statistics. We see that the chances or the likelihood of having a fetal heartbeat, this is a clinical pregnancy, after three embryo transfer, and again, I'm talking about single euploid, uh, embryo transfer after NGS, it's 95.2, which is quite impressive. And if we look at the likelihood of having not heartbeat, but having a baby at home after three embryo transfers, it's 92.6. So it seems that there's very little room for improvement in terms of implantation failure. It seems that is the embryo, the main player here. But of course, uh, we could do better, or, or there's this uh, about 10% couples that probably need to improve something. Uh, to have this baby at home. And the main problem, of course, as you can imagine, and, and I'm sure as you uh, face this problem on a daily basis in your clinics, is that the difficulty is to find three euploid blastocysts to transfer because most of these couples that we see in our hospitals, they do not make so many embryos. Many of them have one or maybe two if they're lucky, and it, it, otherwise they need to have another round of IVF, which is uh, not easy for them. So having uh, overcome the difficulty, if you have three, healthy single nuclear embryo transfers, you are over 90% chances of having a baby at home. So how do we manage this uh, failed implantation? Because uh, as we know, not all of them do get pregnant. Some of them uh, are extremely frustrated and so are we as physicians. And I think we should uh, open our eyes and look, look around, not only focus on the embryo and the aneuploid screening, but maybe uh, consider the ultrasound evaluation at, at a higher level maybe discuss hysteroscopy with a couple, a couple of words about endometrial scratching. We will discuss briefly uh, transcriptomics of endometrium and finally microbiome and also immunology a little bit. So regarding um, ultrasound, I, I think today we have much better scanners than we used to 10, 15 years ago. So suddenly we do see adenomyosis, which is one of these forgotten diseases that used to be diagnosed by, by MRI which is uh, the gold standard for the diagnosis of adenomyosis, but MRI is quite expensive. So um, we only send women to do an MRI of the uterus uh, in very specific cases when they have extremely severe disease. But uh, with the scanners that we use today, we are able to identify 
many uh, features that are typically associated with adenomyosis. So now there's a renewed interest in this disease and it's very closely linked to endometriosis, as you all know, because they share a lot of the pathogenesis in the origin. So um, we, we should pay more attention into this disease and, and there are some uh, clear and easy to identify features as you have here in this uh, graph. Um, this was described by Naftalin in, in 2012 and he described his group, uh, the, the asymmetrical mammetro thickening that we see these asymmetrical walls in the uterus easy to identify, sometimes parallel shadowing or linear estriations that I'll show you in a minute, sometimes the typical myometro cyst or hyperechoic islands. Uh, um, not always, but sometimes we can find this uh, nodular myometro mass, which is usually heterogeneous, not very well defined, that could be uh, named adenomyomas. And of course, this irregular uh, junction between the endometrium and the myometrium, which was the main focus of the MRI in the past. This is what I mentioned. This is a paper we published uh, three, four years ago, which we uh, looked at the uh, these uh, seven features and you see this globular aspect of the uterus with this uh, asymmetric wall you see a very thin wall here and a very thick wall uh, in front of it you can have some heterogeneous uh, myometro cysts or, or linear estriations that are easily uh, uh, to identify um, some of the classical cysts that we see inside the uh, endometrium sorry the uh, myometrium some of the hyperopogenic nodules uh, and sometimes this irregular nodules called adenomyoma. So it's not difficult to identify these features. We do not need 3D ultrasound. If you have it, that's fine. But just with the conventional 2D and the quality of the scanners that we use today, we can easily suspect that this patient has adenomyosis. And of course, this has an impact on implantation, as we we're discussing today. Uh, here you have a, a beautiful paper by Mabrero Serral, published in RBM Online in 2017. Here you have the score that they did, whether they had just no uh, adenomyosis identified or one, two, three, up to seven uh, characteristics, this naphthalene characteristics that you can see in the scan. And if you look at, at the clinical pregnancy rate after IVF, you can see how with no adenomyosis, you have a very nice success rate in this program. And the higher the adenomyosis score, the lower the probability of clinical pregnancy. So clearly there is an impact of this adenomyosis on the embryo ability to implant and grow. If we look a little bit farther in detail and we try to identify what happens with the gene expression at the endometrial level in adenomyosis, uh, happens most of the times that you do gene analysis, you will find differences. Uh, when you look at any um, large uh, database of um, genes, you will find a few hundreds that go up and a few hundreds that go down. Uh, and sometimes, uh, not always, but sometimes this, this regulation of the genes may be relevant to have a clinical message. And this is what we suspect. We did this study a uh, long uh, time ago, almost uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we biopsied some women who had clearly uh, diagnosed, have been diagnosed with adenomyosis. And we look at the window of implantation at that time, 238 genes. You can see here the controls. And you can see here the, the heat panel for the adenomyotic patients. And again, you don't need to be an expert. Just look at the amount of reds and the amount of greens and you can clearly identify a difference between adenomyotic or non-adenomyotic uh, patient. And I, uh, clearly we identified 34 genes that were dysregulated in these patients that may contribute to the, uh, to the lower outcome uh, regarding IVF. What about hysteroscopy? Well, I think at some point it became kind of a routine after you have a failed uh, case or a couple of failed cycles, uh, why not? Let's do a hysteroscopy and, and check that the cavity is fine. And many times when you uh, put a hysteroscopy inside the uterus, you may find things that you may do see as well by ultrasound. The truth is that if you see some filmy additions, of course you're going to remove them, but are these filmy additions responsible for the failure? When you find the polyp, I think uh, you don't need a hysteroscopy for that. You can see polyps that have just a few millimeters, not even uh, five millimeters, and you can identify them by ultrasound. So again, no need to do a hysteroscopy as a rule, but maybe you were facilitating the, the cervical dilation, maybe you were washing the cavity, the cavity maybe this theoretical uh, pseudo scratching concept that was there. So uh, uh, quite a few papers came out retrospectively showing that hysteroscopy prior to IVF in failed cases could be beneficial. And in, in 2016, there were a couple of studies, one from uh, the Dutch, from the Netherlands, and one from El Tuki in England and the UK. 
uh, were published in The Lancet in the same issue. And here I, I bring you the, the one published by Atuki. Um, this was, as I said, published in The Lancet in 2016, quite a good journal to publish this paper. It was called The Trophy Trial. It was multi-center, so not only in, in the London unit. It included eight hospitals, including UK, Belgium, Italy, and Czech Republic. They prospectively randomized uh, more than 700 women to either undergo hysteroscopy or not uh, before IVF. And all of these patients were good prognosis patients under 38. And you know by now the result. If you look at the uh, pregnancy rate, the clinical pregnancy rate, and the life birth rate, whether they underwent hysteroscopy or, or no hysteroscopy, the outcome was absolutely the same. Whether you look uh, per participant, per patient, or per patient who underwent embryo transfer, or even per patient who underwent top quality embryo transfer, similarly, the outcome was the same. So probably today we do not need to consider IVF, uh, sorry, uh, hysteroscopy prior to uh, IVF in cases of failure. Maybe you, you should uh, consider a very detailed ultrasound and only when you identify in this ultrasound things that could be removed by surgery, then uh, do the hysteroscopy to the patient, but not for diagnostic purposes, for surgical purposes. Therapeutic. What about the scratching? And this is a, a story that keeps going around for years. Um, the story, I think it was originated in, in Israel, if I'm correct. Uh, there were a few uh, patients that were being investigated for implantation failure. At that time, endometrial biopsy was quite common and they realized they were very, very um, um, clever to identify that those patients who had a biopsy, interestingly, they became pregnant uh, the next month. So they thought maybe by creating this inflammation in the endometrium, we may, I don't know, create this uh, inflammatory environment or maybe call stem cells because of this inflammation to the niche that have been scratched and uh, have a benefit. So uh, seven of studies came out, uh, all of them retrospective. There were even um, uh, meta-analysis and, and systematic reviews showing the beneficial effect. But most of these studies were retrospective and with very limited sample size, which is many, many times the main criticism to studies, not because it's published and because it's online or because it's on, on, on PubMed, means that this is the ultimate truth. Uh, Similarly, not because it's a randomized trial, again, is the holy grail, but I think we need large uh, series of patients and, and hopefully uh, prospectively randomized so we can really know if what we're doing, whatever intervention it is, is making a benefit for the outcome of our patients, or if it's just uh, something that could happen by chance, by random, but is not because of the intervention. And, and this is why this group, uh, Lenz and Aral, performed this study. Um, that was published again in a very nice journal, the New England Journal of Medicine, in 2019, so quite recent. And they were trying to figure out if this scratching uh, procedure would became very popular and all the patients were asking about it uh, around the world because it's uh, simple, it's not very expensive, it's not risky, and all, all the patients wanted to have their uterus scratched because they had read somewhere that it was beneficial. So this group this, did this prospective randomized study with a very large sample size. If you look at it, it's almost 1,400 patients, so, so tremendously large numbers. And, and the outcome was quite conclusive. I think if you look at the live birth rate, which is the, the main outcome, it was exactly the same across groups, whether it was scratching or controls. Same for clinical pregnancy or for miscarriage. So after this study, it was quite clear that as a rule for a general IVF population, Endometrial scratching has no benefit. What about transcriptomics of the endometrium? And, and I'm sure you have been exposed in the last 10 years to a lot of information again about um, the investigation of the uterus. And as you know, there are uh, different commercially available tests and, and different companies looking at different genes. And the, the interesting thing is that when you look at the genes that each different company is studying, there's very, very little overlapping. So it seems that the, the crucial genes must be very, very few because each uh, test is looking at different family of genes, most of them. Uh, as you know, what we're trying to identify is the, the ideal timing of this uh, endometrial um, implantation window. Um, there are a few days across the luteal phase that the ember may implant. And even though it could implant almost anywhere any day, the truth is that there's a peak of implantation around pre P4 to P6, some women have this window uh, 
expressed in a late fashion. Some, have ha some women have an advancement of the expression of the genes and a small group of patients may have a shorter window than, than the two or three days that we always expected. Um, this is not that relevant in, in fertile couples because the couples, when they try to have a baby, they don't time the intercourse, they just have intercourse and they do get pregnant, so it cannot be that crucial. But the truth is that in some women, uh, it could be interesting because we always put the progesterone in the luteal phase equally to every patient. We do not individualize the luteal phase supplementation. I think today we are learning that this is becoming an issue and, and some women have different requirements, different timing and maybe different doses of progesterone or whatever you use in the retail phase supplementation. But maybe in, a, in those patients who have difficulties to get pregnant, uh, even with IVF, they may have a difficulty in the genes that are expressed in the, in the window of implantation. The, the evidence out there is not very convincing yet, even though there's plenty of studies that are very promising. And, and the reason is that we're still lacking independent studies that are not performed by the commercial companies and in a prospective randomized fashion. I think this is what we're lacking today because when we have this data, we will be truly convinced that maybe we should investigate the, the metatroscriptomics or not. We will have to wait for this. And not only that, we're looking at displacement, which is the, what I tell you, the, the advancement or, or the late expression of this window of implantation. But some uh, other problem could be not the, the timing, but could be the function of this endometrium. And some studies have looked at the disruption of the, of the window of implantation. Maybe it's not that it's early or late, maybe it's that the window of implantation does not work in this particular patient. Here you have most of the studies have been looking at the displacement of the window. Some have been looking at the disruption and a few of them to both of them. And, and if you look at the genes involved, as I mentioned before, there are not so many that are being shared by, by both ideas. So still many things to uh, read and, and wait uh, before we implement this into uh, routine practice. What about microbiome, which is now the new, uh, the new kid in the block, is the, is the hot topic today. And, and everyone is looking at the microbiome. And we jumped from just looking at the pH of patients a few years ago to very complex uh, QRT-PCR or even NGS, which give us a huge amount of information, sometimes maybe a little bit too much. Again, I think there's a, a change in the paradigm, and we always thought that beyond the uterine cervix, everything was esteral. And this is why we always thought that below uh, the cervix in the vagina, it was normal, it's, it's needed to have flora, vaginal flora, to keep the, the pH and, and beyond that, it should be esteral. But we know today that the endometrium and even the, the, the abdominal cavity is not esteral. You, you can find uh, bacteria there and you can find bacteria, especially with very specific uh, NGS techniques. Probably nothing will grow in a culture, conventional culture, but we know that this is not enough today. So there's been quite a few studies looking at the uh, vaginal microbiome and the impact on reproduction. Uh, in fact, today you will find studies of the impact of microbiome in cancer, in diabetes, in, in psychiatric diseases, in, in almost anything that we can find in the medical field. But of course, we're focusing in, in, in reproduction and implantation today. And one thing we have to understand is that IVF is not esteral. We, we have to have this in concept in mind that if you look at the sperm, for instance, you can see a, a huge amount here of bacteria. Uh, it, this is a recent study from this year, 2020, and if you look at the worst sperm, again, it's better, but again, you will see a huge amount of bacteria could be identified. And of course, after incubation, you will find again more, more, more bacteria, more flora. But if you look at the IVF culture media, again, it's not esteral, uh, according to the standard knowledge. It's, uh, if, you, if you do a, a microbiome study of the culture media, you will find and identify bacteria. So, the question is that if it's clean completely of bacteria or not, maybe that's impossible in human life. The question is how relevant is to find this data that may affect or not the outcome of our patients. So maybe we are testing patients, getting a report, looking at the microbiome, jumping into treatment with antibiotics or, or, or a combination with lactobacilli or, or probiotics, and maybe we're not doing nothing. So I, I think, again, we still need to understand this much better just to make sure that what we're testing may make a difference or not. There's some studies, again, with uh, little numbers that seem to be quite promising. But at the same time, there are studies who are not so convincing. And, and just for you to think about it and, and to, to challenge you a little bit, I brought this study from, from JARC, from a very nice journal again, uh, 
2019. And this Japanese group, what they did is they, they had patients under 40 years of age, so good prognosis patients, 100 of them, who underwent a blastocyst transfer in an HFT cycle, so everything was very well controlled. And what they did is on the day of the transfer, they did a mock embryo transfer, then they removed the catheter, and with a clean catheter, they did the transfer. But the first one uh, was uh, used to identify uh, the microbiome. And they found in this just uh, 100 patient population that about one in three um, had a dysbiotic endometrium, one third. But then when they look at the outcome and they look at the pregnancy rate, you can see that the women who had dysbiotic endometrium had similar outcome than women with eubiotic endometrium. Look at the pregnancy rate is about 53, 54%. Maybe a not significant, slightly higher miscarriage rate, but this could be due to the low numbers. But again, it doesn't seem to have a huge impact, at least in this particular study. So I'm not saying that microbiota should not be studied. I think it should be investigated in, in a research setting and wait again for a, for a properly designed uh, prospective randomized study. And, and, and that's when we will learn if we need to intervene and do something or maybe not that much. And in fact, uh, this is one of these studies that is being performed nowadays. This is uh, from the group of Peter Humaydan in Denmark. Uh, Dr. Hart is the first author. And this is what they submitted to the uh, clinical trial registry. They, they have a very interesting study. They, they are targeting by qPCR, which is much, much cheaper than, than NGS, and targeting only uh, this bacteria, Gardnerella and Atopobium vaginae, mainly because these are the main players when you get a report from NGS. These are the ones that have a higher, significantly higher prevalence than the rest. So they identified these two uh, for this um, vaginosis, and they randomized patients into three groups. They have 333 patients. First group is receiving clindamycin and, and lactobacillus crisparus. Uh, second group only clindamycin plus placebo, and the third group only placebo. And they will see if this has an impact or not on the outcome. So I think this study will open uh, our eyes and probably answer, maybe not definitely, but for sure will answer one of the questions that we have today. Should we treat women with a dysbiotic endometrium or dysbiotic vagina, or maybe we suggest wait and the, the physiology will restore because it has no impact on the outcome. So looking forward to the results of this study, to be honest. And finally, uh, just a couple of words on the uterine immune environment. I think immunology is, again, one of the new areas uh, today. It was new in the 90s, then it disappeared when genetics came into place, and then again, when genetics couldn't answer every question that we had, immunology went up again and, and in a different fashion. I think there's still many things that we do not fully understand from implementation, and I think the immunologists will help us to improve the outcome of our patients by <clears throat> understanding a few issues that we do not control yet. Um, one of them is the, the impact of what we do, the, the viral stimulation on the endometrium. And there's always this concept that by stimulating the ovaries, this is not very physiological. We're going to have huge amount of esterase and circulation, among other things. And this may compromise the outcome of a fresh embryo transfer. And this gave, uh, um, they the, the set the path actually to the concept of free soil a few years ago. It seemed that because of this wrong um, endometrium, we should freeze the embryos and then transferring natural cycle later. But I think today we have enough data that this is not the truth. Uh, frozen cycles do better when you have a reason to freeze, not because it's a non-stimulated cycle. And of course, in those women at risk and women who are for PTA and for many different indications, we should freeze, but it's not going to improve the outcome in a patient who has uh, no risk of OHSS and doesn't need uh, the freezing. So, Trying to understand what was the impact of this ovarian stimulation on the endometrium, Diana Alexandru from our group in, in Madrid uh, published in RBM online last year an uh, uh, interesting study showing that the ovarian stimulation does not influence the, the immune environment in healthy infertile women. What she did is she took biopsies from endometrium of, of uh, patients and of uh, controls as well. So we have fertile couple, fertile uh, women and infertile women. We took uh, endometrium from natural cycle and from stimulated cycles, so four groups identified. As you look at the uh, number and the percentage of immune cells present by immunohistochemistry and flow cytometry and even gene expression, he did a, a very nice experiment using the, uh, to looking at the uterine natural killer binding to this tetramer of HLAC. So this would be like an artificial embryo getting in touch with these uterine cells. 
And see, look at the expression also of the TNF alpha and IL 10, which are, are you know, are the two main cytokines produced on the implantation. And she could not find any difference in any of these aspects, not in the number or percentage of immune cells, not in the binding to the tetramere, nor in the cytokine production. So it doesn't seem that ovarian stimulation has an impact on the immune cell population, whether it's fertile women or infertile women, whether it's a natural cycle or, or a non-stimulated cycle. So again, new ideas, new concepts that will help to provide better care to our patients. And finally, to conclude, I think uh, that the main driver of implantation is the embryo. I think we all agree today that even though everything is important, probably 80 or 90 percent of the success relies on the embryo. So the better the embryo, we're looking at the morphology and the cleavage rate and the euploidy and probably more things in the future, the better the outcome. So no question about that today. Uh, we know that true implantation failure is very limited. If we look at the data from Pirtea, after three euclid embryo transfer, you have up to 90-95% success rate. So it's only 5-10% to patients who may benefit of these extra investigations. But still, we have to consider the morphology, as we discussed before. I think the things that could be improved, sometimes you have this adenomyotic uh, uh, uterus that may give you even a, a T-shaped uterus that could benefit from a metroplastia. I think that the, the issue about transcriptomic signature is not close today. I think there are things that need to be investigated further and try to understand if we can even get this information without taking a box and make it maybe just by endometrial aspiration, we should be able to get a similar information. The issue about microbiome, I think, is uh, still a hot topic, but uh, many questions are solved today. Uh, should we test routinely, maybe just patients with implantation failure? Should we do NGS to everyone? Should we just treat empirically because the treatment is it's, uh, cheap and is risk-free? And, and regarding immunology, again, there are many, many things that we do not know yet. And we cannot just jump into testing and treating patients with no diagnosis of, of immune disease. So probably testing NK cells in the uh, peripheral blood doesn't make much sense to me. Maybe uh, trying to understand the, this interaction between the uterine NK cells and the HLAC may seem uh, promising for the future and maybe even integrated in a, in, a, in a model of identifying couples of high prognosis or low prognosis. And that's what I wanted to discuss with you today. I think we will have some time for questions. So um, thank you very much for attending this webinar. And Juan, thank you very much. It was really an excellent presentation. Very interesting the way you present it and the topic is very interesting. I have a lot of questions here, but I would like to get your opinion just very shortly, and I'll present the question. And let's start with hatching. What do you think about hatching of the embryos at different stages to increase implantation? Uh, well, assisted hatching was, uh, I think it was caught in the 90s or early 2000s. Because we had this concept that uh, the sauna pellucida could be too too tough for the embryo to break and, and couldn't go out of the embryo. This is like if you have an embryo in a room and you open the door for the embryo to come out of the sauna pellucida. But I think the embryo has to be able to hatch. Uh, if you open the door to an embryo which is abnormal, it's not going to come out of the room. So we stopped doing it because we couldn't see any benefit. And I know there are studies that could say otherwise, but our experience was not good in, in, in assisted hatching on day three. And we only perform hatching today, of course, on day three, when we're going to do embryo biopsy on day five. But just for the biopsy, not because we think it helps implantation. So my, my recommendation is that assisted hatching does not work. But again, um, probably not everyone agrees with that. <clears throat> there are several papers showing that giving GnRH agonist at the time of embryo transfer improve implantation. Probably you know the papers coming from the Tesari group. What do you uh -huh. think about and are you giving shots of GnRH agonist during the time of embryo transfer? Well, that, that was a very interesting concept. Um, I remember at that time that the, the slides from the study, because I was in Valencia, so I'm talking about year 96, 97, more or less. So a long time ago, and, and that gave us a, a good idea to investigate if there was receptors for GNH agonists in the endometrium, and we found them, and maybe uh, receptors for GNH agonists on the embryo, and they exist, they, they do have receptors for the embryo, so, so the concept could work. And, 
And, and this is what happened. And many times we have seen ex uh, experiences like this. You have a, an idea, then you look at the rationale behind it. So it makes sense. If you have receptors in the endometrium and the embryo, maybe by giving agonists, we could increase implantation. There's always uh, a few promising uh, studies, usually with low numbers. And then you jump into larger studies, and most of these big differences just fade away. So this is what we saw. There was a, a very nice study from Turkey coming from, I think it was Bulent Urman, the, the senior author. They did a randomized study, uh, giving GNRH agonists a uh, uh, mid-luteal phase in, with almost 500 patients randomized. This was published in Human Reproduction, and they couldn't find any difference. So again, uh, the concept makes sense. The rationale behind it is it, it, it's logical but uh, we haven't found evidence of, of its benefits, so we stopped doing it. Okay, I want to come back to the endometrial injury, the scratching that you mentioned, which is a very highly controversial issue still today, even after the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine, Petitis Cerity and Human Reproduction. And there are two questions. First of all, are you doing in IVR Madrid? Are you doing any scratching? Is there any small group of patients that you think it's beneficial? Well, scratching, is a, I think, as a concept, is very interesting because uh, if you think about it as, as a concept, you think, okay, if I do a scratching on the luteal phase of a patient, in a few days, he's going to have a menstruation. So whatever I did in the endometrium is going to disappear. The endometrium is going to shed, and she's going to build a new endometrium. So probably it, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. The truth is that the data that was published in Israel a few years ago was quite convincing. And just by random, looking at the outcome of patients who had this diagnostic biopsy in the luteal phase before, seemed quite interesting. So that, that's what, like, okay, maybe we're doing something that is not just so superficial. Maybe we're creating an inflammation that lasts for the next cycle. Uh, or maybe, as, as Hugh Taylor uh, mentioned one day, maybe we are creating inflammation, and this is recruiting the stem cells into the cell niche in the basal layer of the endometrium that may help for the next uh, cycle to have a better endometrium. Um, I think the evidence is quite limited, to be honest. Uh, the study of the New England Journal of Medicine, I think, is quite convincing in terms of design and the data that provides. I know it's not the final answer. There are a few, uh, there's a paper from Nick Macklin recently showing that maybe in a specific subgroup of patients could be beneficial. And what we're doing today at EV Madrid is a study. Uh, we're trying to finalize a study, randomize a study between Valencia and Madrid uh, in egg recipient patients. So this would be the ideal candidates. They have a, a, a good quality in the embryo, uh, they have a, a standardized way of, of preparation of endometrium, and we need to finalize the study to see if it's beneficial or not. We, because it's randomized and, and blinded, I have no data to tell you today, but I think this type of studies, and I know if you look into clinical trials.gov, you will find three or four other larger studies being run at this moment, uh, they will identify maybe those patients who may benefit from this procedure or maybe just close this, the, the story of scratch and say it doesn't help. Uh, my personal impression uh, is that it doesn't make a big difference. I haven't seen something that was quite shocking, as, uh, but again, this is a personal experience and we shouldn't rule our, our decisions by personal or individual cases. I just want to take the privilege of being the moderator of this session and add a sentence here. The story of scratching started with a different study. There was a study looking at Conexin 43 in implantation failure patients, and it was decided just randomly to take four biopsies from the patients, two during the follicular phase and two during the luteal phase, 12 patients. And these patients were promised to have another cycle at the end of the study, just after the scratching. And it came out that out of 12 patients, 11 became pregnant. And then there was a prospective control study to look at this scratching in patients with endometrial failure, uh, sorry, in uh, implantation failure and thin endometrium. I just have to say that there were 300 publications about scratching following this study during the last 70 years, but none of these papers or none of this study follow the original methodology to do four scratching of the endometrium. So people do one, two, three, one and during the, 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 the shedding of the endometrium. You know, people did lots of things 
based on this scratching, but there is no paper, no study showing that if you do four times scratching in implantation failure group, you will not get a benefits from this procedure. So this is, you know, just a side comment to this endometrial scratching. But you, you're very right. I think this is the same with hysteroscopy. Not, not everyone is doing the procedure in the same uh, way. So I agree with you that no one replicated those very early findings. But, but it's also very difficult to convince a patient to undergo four biopsies in a month. So uh, I agree. I agree. So just a few other questions to get your opinion. What do you think about adding DHEA to improve ovarian performance? Well, that's a that's a nice topic because uh, I I have written an, uh, a paper in RBM online um, along with uh, Dr. Gleiser that we have been discussing a bit about this topic. I, I think the concept of androgen supplementation is extremely attractive, and the the reason behind it again has logic and it makes sense because when there's ovarian aging, you uh, free androgen concentration not linked to SHDA, uh, that the free circulating testosterone and estrogen down DHA is going to be diminished. So if you have lower androgens in circulation, you may have lower estrogen production, you may have lower oxide quality and, and maybe a worse outcome. So uh, what we did is um, look at the effect of testosterone um, in, in granulose cells. And, and you can increase the, the expression of the FSH receptor. You can quantify this. This is published in, in the European Journal a few years ago. So if you put testosterone, you put androgens in the cells, in the granulose cells, you increase the expression of the FSH receptor. So we thought maybe if we give androgens, the outcome should be better. And maybe those patients may benefit from supplementation of androgens. They will do a better response and obviously a better outcome or maybe lower uh, failures or lower miscarriages. And, and the group of, of Dr. Gleiser has uh, nice studies uh, in this line. They have shown uh, quite a beneficial effect of this uh, supplementation with DHA. I know he participated in a webinar like this in the series that he clearly explained where and, and who may benefit from this supplementation. Our personal experience is not as good as his, and, and we have tried not only DHA, um, because again, the problem that we all have with DHA and, and, and as well as as uh, the group that I mentioned, is that you have to supplement for three or four months, but our patients are not ready to wait for three or four months. They want to decide from now, so you have to minimize that maybe to four, six weeks. We supplemented with um, with testosterone patches and testosterone cream, and and our, the outcome was non-different. We, we did actually a PhD thesis of one of our doctors, couldn't show any benefit. Um, there's studies out there in randomized fashion showing uh, short supplementation of two weeks, and that may be the reason, no impact. Uh, we have a randomized trial um, published in JCM from Valencia, again, so no benefit. So I think the problem is that it doesn't work. I think the problem is that we do not know exactly which patients may benefit from this supplementation, because my, my take on this whole concept of DHA supplementation is that if we were able to identify those patients, small group of patients who could benefit, and supplemented long enough to grow the follicles from the from the primary stage, it means three, four months, then we may see a difference. But the problem is that we don't have that luxury of, of time. Patients are not ready to wait for four months. And, and this is why the, the shorter effect could be done by testosterone, but the truth is that uh, we couldn't see any benefit. Thank you. And what do you think about, there is a long discussion about the drug we should stimulate with. So the question is whether we have to add to the stimulation protocol LH, HCG, whether FSH is enough. What, what are you doing in Madrid? Well, uh, <clears throat> based on, on, on many publications, and, and there's still papers coming out, it's interesting how this LH story keeps uh, giving us a headache on a, on a daily basis. But um, based on different studies, based on our own data, uh, the randomized trial from Bosch a few years ago, um, we take it as in a very pragmatic way. It may not be the best, it could not be uh, the most scientific, but it's what we do on a daily practice. We again think that beyond 35, there's a, there's a drop in androgen concentration, so there's a drop in, in uh, estradiol production, and this could um, benefit from LH addition. 
So from a pragmatic way, what we do is patients below 35, we stimulate only with uh, recombinant FSH, and beyond 35, we always add LH action, LH activity. And how we do that, most of the times we add HMG, highly purified HMG. Sometimes we use recombinant LH, but most of the times uh, HMG in a ratio of three to one, two to one. And the last question, I want to ask you about the luteal phase and supplement of the luteal phase. There are lots of studies to show that iron progesterone, uh, oral progesterone, vaginal progesterone, are actually, and subcutane, are actually doing the same job. And they're all good. So what do you prefer to use uh, in uh, Madrid? What do you think is um, best for patients? Well, the case, again, if we talk about um, HCG trigger, because uh, if we use uh, agonist trigger, we, we don't transfer. And we, after agonist trigger, we freeze, and then we transfer. If, it's, if it is after HCG trigger, uh, I have to say that in Spain, we do not have intramuscular progesterone. Uh, it was in the market and it disappeared because it was quite painful. It has some secondary effects and it hasn't shown uh, in, in randomized trials any benefit. So the options are uh, oral or vaginal. And the oral that we have is uh, micronized progesterone. So it's not very well tolerated. It creates dizziness and, and patients feel sleepy. So we use vaginal root always. And we only use uh, vaginal unless at the time of the embryo transfer in frozen cycles or in egg donation cycles, that's when we measure the levels of progesterone. And if they do not reach uh, 9.2 nanograms, we supplement with subcutaneous. So mm, in first IVF, it's only a vaginal progesterone, uh, two doses, morning and night. If it's um, frozen cycle or egg donation, we add vaginal progesterone, we measure progesterone at the time of the embryo transfer, and if it's below our limits, we supplement with subcutaneous as, as, as a supplement. Thank you. It was really interesting. Thank you very much for your time. It was an excellent lecture and very nice discussion. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much for the invitation. I hope it was useful. Thank you so much. Thank you.